And we are now about to be joined by the man of the hour, Mr. Hank Thompson. How you doing, man? Hey, I'm well. How are you? Doing good, man. Doing great. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to yeah. join us this morning, Hank, or this afternoon, rather. Of course. Um, super excited to have the conversation. And, you know, just in case anyone is tuning in that might be a little bit confused, maybe they've never tuned into the Vanguard for the, uh, you know, they haven't tuned in in a while or maybe never before. I was actually at one point a huge fan of the Young Turks. Like, I'm not coming at this from the place of a total hater, someone who just realized that, you know, you can get a lot of clicks by talking shit on the Young Turks. TYT was really one of my first big exposures to not just progressive media, but what I considered at the time to be genuine progressive thought. You know, it was a huge, uh, a huge bastion of progressivism during the Bernie era, of course. And, you know, I was even just like rewatching an old TYT video the other day from like, I don't know, 2015, 2016. It was about that, that poor woman, Jesus. She was like, uh, this uh, woman that looked exactly like Ted Cruz, and she, she got a job uh, as like a in like some porno at the time because it was like in 2016 during the primary, and Ted Cruz was really popular. And this woman just literally looked like the female Ted Cruz, and she was able to you know get this deal. Anyway, Jake and Anna were having a just an absolutely hilarious time roasting the story, making you know fun of the circumstances and all. And I was like, damn, this show actually used to be really good. This show used to be kind of edgy. It was funny. Um, you know, had more personality. And then, of course, we've talked about the TYT investment, the Jeffrey Katzenberg money, and how, in my opinion, that kind of was one of the first uh, big signs of them selling out. They kind of sanitized their show, in my opinion. They stopped swearing on air. It just seemed like a lot of the personality behind the Young Turks started to evaporate. And unfortunately, you know, as we later found out, so did seemingly a lot of their progressive values, as we learned um, when the TYT union tried to start. Jenk Uger essentially tried to bust the union. And that's what we wanted to have you on here to talk about, because you actually made a documentary, the first part of which is currently out, called Tell the Truth, Jenk. We introed it a little bit you know, discussed a bit about what the subject of the film was. Um, but welcome to the stream, Hank. In your own words, please tell everyone a little bit about this film and just an sure. intro to your experiences. Oh, man. Well, OK, that goes way back. So, yeah, I, I relate to a lot of what you're talking about in terms of being a fan of TYT. Uh, you know, like a lot of people, my political kind of uh, consciousness has evolved from sort of like like a moronic kid who identified with his dad's conservatism into like mildly independent thinking teenager. And then like across the liberal spectrum towards we should burn this whole fucking system down because it's destroying lives constantly. And it's actually designed to destroy lives. And we need to stand up for ourselves in order to have a hope of making it a livable planet for the next you know little while. <laughs> so um, TYT was a huge part of that in my kind of story. I, st I started listening to TYT in I think 2007 ish or something like that, you know, like, I had sort of progressive, so I'm a bit older than you guys. I, by the way, thanks for having me on. Love, uh, I was, I'm thrilled to come on here. Uh, I've been oh, yeah, watching pleasure, your stuff over the last couple of years. Um, you know, the, the 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 drama stuff and the, <laughs> the the chatter about the. I think that's a an important uh, uh, part of the ecosystem. You know, I think I, I think it's a def it's it's defensible. If that's the only thing that the internet consisted of, it would probably be bad. But anyway, I'm getting too far afield. So it's a pleasure to be here and. Uh, but yeah, I, I started listening uh, in 2007 ish, eight ish. I was kind of like a liberal. I wasn't real political. I didn't I wasn't raised with like leftist principles or like even uh, much consciousness about labor. I never had an antipathy about like labor organizing or anything like that. But um, I had progressive leanings in my like 20s. Right. Uh, and I was uh, living in Chicago, uh, running an aquarium business. <laughs> so I had a lot of time to myself just listening to podcasts. I was always just on my, in my earbuds doing, doing my thing. Occasionally I'd have to be bothered by, you know, people asking stupid questions. Uh, and so I, I would just flick, flick water at them and they would go away when I was, uh, when I was, why am I trying to be funny? Um, so TYT like came up, came about with air America, like, as you guys recall, when air America first launched, there was like a few shows like the Al Franken show, Rachel Maddow, Chuck D Liz Winstead. That's a, that's a deep cut. Um, who else had a show? There was a few. Oh, uh, King Hartman, obviously. We all love Tom Hartman uh, and TYT. And I didn't know shit about them. So I started listening and they 
scratch that itch you know they i i like the the railing about money and politics and the screaming and stuff and and as you kind of described like it was it was entertaining there's actually an interesting part of the film i'm working on uh that uh that ha i haven't really edited it yet but it's relating to like the misogyny part of that just to jump right into that bit i i'm embarrassed at how rotten it was <laughs> like that i wasn't repulsed as a viewer as a fan uh like you mean like then. with the the commentary the on-air sort of jokes yeah. and, and yeah that kind of stuff yeah. and yeah are you also talking about like behind the scenes like what was discussed with the jimmy door thing or is that separate no 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 i don't mean that okay. i'm just talking like gotcha. as a viewer as, as gotcha. someone who and, and as i'm planning on presenting a portion of that in the film um because there's i have a kind of this outline chunk of uh of sort of the history of the company a little bit more um mm -hmm. probably should put that earlier in the movie but that's okay so I'm, but I, I like the way I'm going to approach it is to sort of talk about my own embarrassment, my own sense of growth, and in, instead of just like dragging Jenk over the coals yet again for all that old misogyny stuff, uh, it's it's not as because it's part of the campaign. So it's like much of this this project, let, let me let me try to get through that little bio stuff, and then I'll j jump. We can jump over to the project because uh, I can easily get, get get ahead of myself. So, um, kind of some deep lore with TYT is that I started listening, or I, I recommended it to a buddy. And he became like a, a volunteer and then eventually became one of their first outside hires. So he moved to L.A. I, we, he and I drove across the country. It was part of TYT's early expansion. It was kind of like a big deal at the time. It was it was a big deal. And uh, so he played a critical role in that. And that's the contact I had. So then I started doing stand up comedy in like 2009. And it always been like a tinkerer with cameras and editing and filming shit and never really found my focus at that. But I, I knew I had a. Uh, it always felt good to me to do stuff like that. And so I started to make short films and sort of doing some editing stuff. And I, I threw it out to my friend that, Hey, maybe I could move across the country. Kind of tired of this fish tank shit. It's driving me nuts. <laughs> so it doesn't, it wasn't really fulfilling me, even though it was great to a great day job for doing comedy all the time. And, uh, that's the contact that I had that got me to the job that were eventually moved across the country in 2013. So I, I worked for TYT between 2013 and uh, 2015 ish some at some point and then freelance for a little while. During that time, I did like almost every job that you could imagine studio setup, um, you know, uh, directing, editing. So I was I was a big part of the Jimmy Dore show, though, at the time, way back in those early days. And in fact, just to rewind a little bit more. Um, because of my contact at TYT, since I was in Chicago, I was just a fan of comedy podcasts. I was, and I was listening to Jimmy's show, Comedy and Everything Else. And he, you know, he would go on like jags about politics occasionally. And I was like, oh, this guy's kind of funny. He's an LA comedian. Uh, I'll just tell my friend. And so I recommended Jimmy to the Young Turks and uh, had to do it twice, actually. Uh, wow. I, mean, I, I reminded him after a month. So like, I'm literally you? like the, yeah, I'm like the guy who'd recommended <laughs> Jimmy to the TYT. <laughs> Like they might have eventually wound their way to meet, but LA is filled with comedians who have liberal tendencies. It's not like that would have happened for sure. But because yeah. of me, it actually, it lit like it's a very clear like stitch in that story. So I have like this kind of like deep kind of lore with TYT. I'm like a red shirt that you'd see in Star Trek, you know, like, like but a guy you'd like, like, oh, I've seen that guy in a couple of things in the past. So, like, yeah, that's a recurring that's extra. A, Yes, a recurring extra, right? Exactly. And now doing this video, I've gotten myself a speaking role in in, in a way, sort of. You know, uh, I'm, I'm an ensign finally. Yeah. Um, that's, but um, yeah. So I quit that. But I, I so oh, the other job that I did that I, I wound up doing was like um, publishing, like writing headlines, SEO. I got two certifications in digital rights management and audience growth and development, which you can tell I use on my own YouTube channel, the one that's already up to up to 570 <laughs> subscribers after toiling away at it for years and years but i've been very inconsistent um so that that was my thing there and then um i worked for them in a freelance capacity for a little while after that because it's like a difficult role to fill to find somebody who knows the company culture who has the writing skill and like kind of the can do that so easily so following that you guys remember when jimmy started uh, posting um his own stuff on youtube in 2015 like late 2015 um that was me i was I guess, because at tot i was the comedian guy right so i'd say you know stand-up experience and stuff and so they i was jimmy's like main dude at tyt did all kinds of different jobs feel free to jump in and ask any specifics by the way i'm trying to rush through this oh no you're good and bro so i had a relationship with jimmy right and he, so he called me up and was like you want to i'm gonna start doing my own videos and so i was like all right yeah okay I, I was desperate for money i'd been having a hard time finding work you know um i can't tell my story without bringing up that i have 
I've had a lot of like a, a challenges uh, with emotional and mental issues. So to, to just to, to jump fo- jump to the the not conclusion, but the the major reveal on that is that I didn't know I was autistic for most of my life up until a couple of years ago. I'm also certain I'm ADHD as well. And uh, yeah, so that was like a big deal for me to like finally be like, oh, that explains so fucking much about why <laughs> I'm such a such a underperforming screwball. Not that that's the definition of autism, by the way. But uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a major change in my whole world because I did. I, I still have issues and stuff. And uh, yeah, but the, these these little bit of lights I have in here are already dogging my brain in a way. But um, so anyway, back 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 to the story in 2015, 2016. I'm the guy that's doing all the work for Jimmy. I was like his number one, you know, main. There wasn't really anybody else. Uh, I, you see, you might, and I also got to do on air stuff. So you might have heard my voice in 2016. This was before the Placone era started because we didn't have a second camera yet. Uh, I knew Ron um, here and there. He was, I don't think he, oh my God, he's on screen. Look at that. What a guy. <laughs> he misspelled you, by the way. Um, the, uh, so I, I, I don't think he had moved to LA and, you know, so, but like the Jimmy thing. So like when he went to um, Bernie Sanders show or, you know, we went and covered Bernie Sanders rallies. Uh, we did a Trump rally in Anaheim. That was the guy behind the camera. And did all the editing and publishing and like a lot of graphics and stuff. Like I, I hung the sound panels in his studio. I'm not sure what studio he uses these days, but also just in know, case anyone's a, wondering, are you still, uh, are you still cool with Jimmy Dore? Are you guys still friends? I wouldn't describe our really, no, no. I wouldn't say we're friends. We're not enemies. I'm not. I, <laughs> I, I actually think it could be pretty entertaining. Some of the stories I could come out with about Jimmy or whatever. But I, if I ever do like tell those things, I didn't sign an NDA. Um, it's not all positive, but it's not all negative either. You know, like I'm, I'm pretty like stuck on the idea of like thorough and like thoroughness and nuance and being fair and honest and stuff like that. Partially why I'm Those are trademarks do... of Jimmy's career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, you know, it's, he's, 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 he's traversed. He's, he's on his own. I'll just use the word journey. He's cer- certainly headed off in a direction that I don't, that, I don't know one if you ask me, but yeah, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, and I've seen your guys' kind of coverage of that too, which is which you know. We have loud mouths. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so no, I'm not looking to beef with Jimmy about stuff. I mean, that's I'll, cool. I'm, that's I'm, cool. I'm sort of saving that for the memoirs. Oh. I did actually go back to TYT, um, uh, in 2018, and so that's like the critical part period of time in which the union uh, organizing kind of occurred. Uh, and that's or, after or, they took the money, right? Or was that in 2019? The Katzenberg money think- and the big investment. I don't, I'm not sure. I think the Katzenberg stuff was 2017 and there, there's a yeah. little bit more nuance to that. Like there, the first, the, before the Katzenberg thing, they got a, a $4 million investment from Buddy Romer, who was right. like a old school kind of Republican guy, not like the evil Ted Cruz types, but, uh, and then they got the Katzenberg cash. Yeah. Katzenberg yeah. was 2017, by the way, just yeah, for the right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like a consortium before, you know, as all those financial deals are, it gets, it, it's when people just mention it's Katzenberg, it's actually like four different right. companies that united yeah. behind some kind of, you know, all these, these, these money ghouls all have their, their legal And Katzenberg got his money from what DreamWorks or some shit like that. Right. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, you know, I, Jenk is trying to operate. He, he, he cornered himself by trying to run a capitalist enterprise on ostensible progressive values so like if you're with with the kind of ambition you have depending you want to have studios you want to have multiple offices in different areas it's like you can't do that without money nothing happens without money so i i kind of i don't necessarily defend jank because i think his argument that money is corrupting and that money is uh, when you pay money to a politician for a bribe you could also make the mm-hmm. argument that when you give someone money for your business that's a form of influence let's just 100%. say maybe we wouldn't call yeah. that a bribe but so I think his argument uh, is falls apart. It, it, it's like I I don't really necessarily distinguish moral. Like it's not like business people are any morally better than politicians. You know what I'm saying? It's like why would that not be also right? Effective, it's also the chief way. criticism that most people have of of uh, legacy media, right? So if you want to come out here and pretend to be the antidote to this corporate media, right. you know, this monopolized media industry where it's entirely driven by, you know, what the mega corporations are willing to advertise with, you know, who's injecting your, you know, uh, whatever media outlet with money and finance. So the whole idea was, and this is something that fucking drives me crazy because I'm not that old. I haven't been on YouTube for that long, but there was a time where we were all resolute in the idea that if you were going to be covering politics, 
and you want to call yourself independent media, then you can't take cash from anybody but your viewers, right? And Gavin and I like to go one step further. We will tell you who every single motherfucker that cuts us a check is. We put them up on screen. Some people can't have their like actual fucking name, but it's not like a public figure. You know what I mean? All of our public figures that donate, there's like three of them, and they're all listed for everybody to see. So in case you know you're like, oh, I'm really worried about getting a call from Susan Sarandon. You know, I don't <laughs> think so. You know what I mean? But like yeah. that's the whole idea. And then TYT, they t and I googled it. Yeah, it's a dream. DreamWorks, former DreamWorks CEO, Jeffrey Katzenberg. So you're taking money from a bunch of people who have incentives for growth metrics. They have incentives for profit margins. They have year over year growth, right? Always grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding. I came from the startup background before I came to my senses and quit everything and started the Vanguard with Gavin. Um, but it, it, you know, it's like those guys, they don't sleep. They just always grow, 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 grow. And that is the antithesis to the values that he was professing on air, right? It's kind of like when he ran for president and he didn't fucking part ways from his own network, which would, if Donald Trump owned a news outlet or if Jeffrey Bezos ran for president and owned the Washington Coast, Post still and was having the Washington Post cover his press releases like they were news and he was having the Washington Post you know write about his uh, rallies and you know oh his book is coming out and all this stuff he's doing a talk come see it all the stuff they would talk about how blatantly corrupt that was but oh not for jank double standard so not to cut you off for a while but no you know that's uh you know the, yeah. yeah I'm picking up what you're putting down <laughs> sure yeah no I, I cut me off please I I, I go long I uh, I relate to your uh, ability to ramble I I, I back in oh, I, yeah, so I started this sure. podcast my own podcast in like 2010 we did a 12 hour bit I I I spoke for 12 hours straight I can go forever if you let me you so, laugh oh. me then after like three and a half I start to <laughs> yeah I sound like weird <laughs> Al in the Nirvana too, video with the marbles in his mouth <laughs> I have the tiger bro. But um, I, I relate to all that. I think those, that criticism is fair. I just don't think it's the worst part about, I think that's like a, a necessary, I, I hate to say necessary evil, but like it's an, ex I can place that into a different category than the sort of reasons why we started the union and yeah. the union busting itself. And Before the ethical lapses that. regarding the, the, the stuff that I'm detailing, because it's relevant. I mean, and, you know, the whole, the, the whole kind of nature of this film project is about power and power dynamics and the relationships that you have with your employers. I mean, that's kind of like my overall, like I have a, a few different goals. Uh, it's like, I want to want to correct the record. They lied about their, uh, their, their uh, workers to their audience. They completely misled their audience about the origins of the union um, as part of a union busting campaign. And the guy's never been challenged for that behavior. No one's ever called him out publicly for it other than like tweets and comments and stuff that, you know, there's sort of a, a, a small trickle of that. Um, but Vanguard let me videos. Really Vanguard videos. Yep, exactly. <laughs> uh, I tell you, man, watching him and Jimmy, when they get into their flare ups, when the, those <laughs> fights, I, I, I've worked for both of them. Like I, I, they're both on my resume among the reasons I'm so unemployable, you know, you <laughs> <laughs> just trapped between in this narcissist quicksand. And, uh, I like, it's, uh, it, my, my POV is I, unique in the world as someone watching them go at it as a person who is like worked and known both of you know very closely oh yeah. i didn't work i might not just to contrast those two experiences like it's not like i was working close up with jank on stuff i was usually on the on the post side of things uh when i went back in 2018 i was a video editor full-time um and so like producers would probably have worked closer in like with jank and over all the years i probably only ever had four or five conversations with jank including the one where i got fired yeah, but um, sorry, I, I sort of derailed. Uh, oh no, you're good. You're good. I do want to. I do want to play the first few minutes of your documentary, yeah. if that's okay with you. Um, just yeah. so the audience can kind of get a taste of uh what this film is all about. And can like I, I said, a... go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll uh toss it back to you in just one second. I just had one more point I wanted to make before we yeah. move on to that about the TYT investment, the Katzenberg stuff, because I do I do see what you're saying, Hank, about it being in a slightly different category than the union busting. Like at least there is some logic behind it, even if it's hypocritical. They were trying to grow their operations, they're trying to reach more people, yada yada yada. You need money to run a business. I understand that. My problem with it is that I I ultimately just think it made the show worse. I don't think it expanded the reach. I don't think it made it more popular. I, I think that they tried to san like self sanitize in an attempt to reach more people, but ultimately just dumbed down what made the show so special in the first place. And yeah, you're right. There was definitely some of that kind of like Howard Stern style, you know, sexism and stuff like that, which tainted their commentary back in the day. But, and I've harped on this a lot. It used to be a much 
more interesting show with a lot more personality. I'm sure you guys that have been longtime members of TYT remember the kind of funny quirks they had with the like the soundboard. You know, they would have the little like animals are innocent. You know, those sounds, mm -hmm. and they had the funny backgrounds. It just I don't know. It yeah, seemed like it had way more. Yeah, exactly. It seemed like they had way more personality, um, way more of like a charming rapport. It seemed like they were really having fun on the job. To me, it always felt like after that investment, they tried really hard to pivot into this like real MSNBC light kind of m mode where it was like, we're going to stop. Um, we're going to stop cursing on air. We're going to kind of remove all of the color and personality from this and try to just like do a internet version of MS MSNBC with a slightly more progressive uh, vibe to it. That, that was the vibe I got. So, you know, if the investment money had actually made TYT better, if it had actually, you know, done something for them, I, I guess I would find it more defensible. But ultimately, I just feel like they sold out and for nothing. And that's why I have such a huge deal with it in addition yeah. to the obvious, you know, hypocrisies. But yeah, what were you going to mention, Hank, before we oh. uh, watch the first few minutes of your uh, film? I just wanted to make it very clear. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. We could honestly talk about that for a lot, a lot much. The not swearing part always, <laughs> always bothered me. Like, it's like, really? Like, but that's the algorithm controlling all, like, we're all sort of subjected to that monster True. of like, oh, watch your link, because we're all careful. Anybody who does content creation, you know, it's, I hate that. Anyway, Except for Zach. Except for Zach. <laughs> <laughs> somebody get them send the van one, one of them got loose you know what so, hey we all we all need like you know every generation needs a ron need danger field you know an andrew dice play somebody that's going to break down the barriers you know and, it's true and, uh, it's and i'm true. happy to yeah. fail at living as a part of that tradition i've been uh failing at this uh, uh attempt at a career for so long that I'm, I'm well into that area where people are like Oh, you know, Roddy Dangerfield didn't get successful until he was in his forties, and like people are trying to reassure you, like, oh, you know, this this guy. Oh, that's Martin, actually that's reassuring to me, guys. That's, By that's the time we're forty, game. maybe we'll get to fifty thousand subs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys got started early, though. You're in your twenties still, so so cherish it, cherish your youth. Um. Anyway, so just I just wanted to make a, a, a disclaimer, so that's just extremely clear that I I'm not in the union and I'm not speaking for the union. I didn't make it into the union. I was very instrumental in the in the origination of it and the start of it. And there's a story there that i haven't told yet that's going to be part of the later chunks of the film but um i was fired i was laid off like a month before the union came forward i got i got laid off the same round as haas francis maxwell and uh and brooke thomas when they they, they chopped some heads off in january so the, and the union came forward in february so i just want people to know i'm not i'm not speaking for the union of representatives well, you mean hassan i didn't know they actually fired him well, laid off, laid off like let formally ended their his working thing. So I I, I edited some of Haas's breakdown. One videos. of the worst <laughs> fucking decisions, dude. Jenk is a horrible <laughs> businessman for a guy who wants to build his like his entire yeah. thing on being a businessman. Here's the thing, you know, we talked about this with our with our buddy Jordan Cheriton, uh, who was like, listen. I have a lot of disagreements with Jimmy. Jim, you know, him and Jimmy have gone back and forth about a lot of stuff. He was like, "There, you put a camera in front of that guy and you get him to spout progressive shit, people are going to watch it, right? As a business mm. decision. He was like, the audacity, like to let that guy walk out the door and think you're going to be a network, like crazy time. You know what I mean? It's And it's the same kind of thing. To let Hassan Piker, who went out and became the number one, I mean, dwarfing the kind of numbers that tyt right. i mean he'll pull i mean i've watched him pull fifty thousand live viewers you know what i mean when he's like just like fucking off just like you know it's probably not everybody i don't know man i'm thinking about getting a new porsche <laughs> yeah but uh, no what do you, you guys have already explained this it's it's still socialism because i do you know how much money i gave to charity our community just raised a million dollars for charity okay but i'm thinking like I'm thinking like metallic blue and your band. If you say anything about this new car, I'm trying to buy. That's what he's doing. And he's getting 40,000 people to watch him. Jake <laughs> missed out on that entire fortune because he's selfish and he doesn't want to see anybody get more fucking uh, cloud or attention than him. Fair. Yeah. The, 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 the thing I was going to mention about the $20 million is it's more the my criticism is more that I think he just fuck, fucking wasted it being a bad businessman. Not no, so much. Again. <laughs> yeah. I've also speculated like, that there was like an expansion. I think it was in line with his ambitions and then there had to be a contraction. What about the TV the, show? They wanted to have like YouTube TV and like make a TYT channel yeah. network like that disastrous decision that Vice did except what Vice did. What here's maybe maybe Jank thought he was being clever and like pulling like a Shane Smith maneuver. Here's what Shane Smith did. He 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 basically rolled and, and fuck Shane Smith. He ruined a really good thing with Vice. But what he did was he absolutely rolled the Time Warner cable people, that entire corporation. And he got them to believe that, oh, you can take all this and you can make your legacy media useful again. And he knew he was selling that shit to the 
devil. He knew it was over for Vice. Uh, he didn't give a fuck. And he watched it go the way of like Rolling Stone, right? Uh, but that's how he was able to do it. And then Jenks like, oh, they're going to TV? <gasps> we should go to TV. And it was like, no, dude, he, he sold it to guys that are taking it to TV because he knew it was over. He was giving it the axe. He was, he was, he was hitting the fucking town with a billion dollars in net worth and saying, fuck this place. I, I made a couple of YouTube videos and now I'm a billionaire. Uh, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, Jenk occupies a weird. Sorry, uh, uh, Gavin. We keep pushing back the start of the pre. The the, the oh, the video it's all good, bro. We have we're in no uh, <laughs> rush at all. So <laughs> I I love um, the long form conversation. Take as yeah. long as you want. Well, this this whole project has all these different like uh, the topics that I, I find so fascinating. I like to like it's kind of what one one of the reasons. There's a lot to dig in here. Yeah, it really because it, it taps into everything about labor, and it's a small enough crew and a small enough story that it actually is like you can get your head around like a smaller group than a bigger group, I guess, in a, in a sense. At least compared to the sort of most whatever. Okay, let me set that aside. Um, just as a, a point to Zach about that, that like Jen kind of occupies a, a a weird place of being a online innovator because they were the first on YouTube, and I think they can rightfully claim they're the first. He even says he's the first YouTuber as like a term that was applied because they were the first partner to partner up with YouTube in the earliest time. And that I'm not going to look into that and challenge it. You know, it's fine. I, you know, that's something he's, I think anybody would no probably. He's marbles in my book. No, I'm... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or uh, Tyler or whatever. Uh, yeah. Jesus, yeah marbles. Um, and, but that is also partly that, that, that decision to go to, to, to YouTube was driven by like them looking for um, uh, a medium to, you know, expand their show on. Right. So like it was, it, it made sense. It was a smart, it was a smart move, but I don't think it actually reflects some kind of innovative mindset. Cause I think partially what holds Jenk back in some ways, as far as like you, you were kind of getting at about vice news is his, you know, he, he's like in his fifties. And so like his earlier formative kind of aspirational years when he was leaving uh corporate law okay. and starting to do like public access shows in Miami. And I think he was on air somewhere in Southern Florida, somewhere, um, but he always aspired to, that to job. like his peer group, his aspirational peer group was always like television news. Like you can see that kind of reflected in the way the set is set up and the sort of uh, ambitions that they sort of had over the years. And, you know, if you're trying to affect political change and you perceive TV news as being an, a, a, a venue to do that at, while also getting yourself rich, because Jenk still aspires to be fabulously wealthy. There's an interview I saw with him where he says he'd, he'd be glad to buy a house in the same neighborhood where obama lives do you, you know, know what's funny Which, go ahead jimmy's also on record uh in an interview with tucker carlson talking about how he how he hopes to be fat be, as like he's like he's like and he got incredible i can't remember who he's talking about but he's talking about a guy with like millions millions and he's like he's like who who knows what uh, that's like i'd like to find out one day or like whatever and it's just like dude you're supposed to be the anti-capitalist you're not supposed to be out right. here glorifying the guy that buys politicians Fair. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what they've got us though with this fucking money stuff is that no matter like our only outlet to get any sense of safety or security is if we have a giant pile of money. So everybody's incentivized to try to seek I out think like that it's, that's, I think it's that's, so embarrassing. I think it's a little bit miss. Like I think people, I think we're taught to like chase that. But one of the things that made me like so much more healthy in my brain was when I realized that like, Oh, you know what? Like, and I'm a single guy. Like, well, I have a girlfriend, but like, I don't have a family, right? Like, I don't have children. I'm not, I don't plan to have children fucking ever, thank God. Uh, but it's just like, if you're just out here and you're just living, like, you really don't need to pursue money that much. You don't need to pursue money that much. Like, I get it. You want to have like a car that works. You want to have a place to live that's, you know, retirement. whatever. Retirement. Go out, have a retirement. But like, I mean, people, like, you, you make a hundred grand. Like, you're going to have most of that shit. If you're, I mean, you know, you're going to, you know, whatever, right? So what's the, what's the appeal? Like, and I totally get people who want to make like 150, 200K, go on vacation a couple times a year. Though, I always remind the left, those people aren't our enemies. Those people are people, like, you want to spend your life hustling and like, you know, be a doctor or whatever. Fuck, go for it. You know what I mean? We need those people. But it's like the aspiration to make a hundred million dollars. It's like, what the fuck for, dude? You want to be a bigger carbon polluter? What the fuck are you doing in your day to day? How are you contributing to society at all? What are you doing to make yourself feel good? Like, you know, people right. have this like amorphous idea. You get like $10 million in your bank account and you're like infinitely happy. I'm like, no, dude, you still have to stare at the clock. You still have to feel the passing of time. You're still going to be bored. You're still going to feel empty, you know, unless you fill your life. So it's just a perverse incentive. I, I feel like the left needs to do a better job at calling that out and saying like, hey, man, like actually like you see how like like we were talking about like Hassan was bitching and moaning about only like 13,000 live viewers the other day. You know what I mean? It's all about perspective. It's all about like, how do you validate yourself? How do you feel good? How do you feel like you're making an impact? And clearly, like, you know, uh, it, it's an it's a zero sum game. If you just look at it like I have to, you know, accomplish like a certain net figure. And I feel like that gets in the way of guys like 
like Jimmy and Jake being truly successful and being truly satisfied uh, and ha- actually like living by their convictions. Yes, I, I agree with you. Like it makes you crazy if you don't have enough and it makes you crazy if you have too much money. It's like it's it's just such a toxic and noxious thing that um, we have to obsess over. That's like my whole kind of like political uh, hope, sure. or at least among them is that someday we can create the conditions in which we can begin to eradicate money. It's the final God. It's like the end boss of a planet that needs to sustain, sustain itself as we have to get rid of this fucking substance, this abstract concept. It, 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 at its very best, it should function as a way to produce receipts. I think it's good to write shit down about when you do stuff. That's all you really need money for, in my opinion. But, you know, yes, the, the way it drives ego, the way it drives status signifiers, the, the kind of people that, you know, look for those giant piles of money. It's, it, there's a, there's a craziness going on there that is, but it, 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 it's because we can't imagine security from other ways. Violence and lots of money are the two easiest ways for Americans that Americans can imagine themselves feeling safe in this country as opposed to a world built around like and trust. That's manifested. And it's, I mm-hmm. mean, TYT has become a microcosm of that. So that even, uh, even if you're a self identified progressive, you're still going to be one penetrated by the perverse incentives of finances and capitalism, as you brought up. And then what the, the desire to insulate yourself from any kind of perceived violence or threat, which they have bought into this social paradox or social scheme rather of like, Oh, the the most vulnerable people, uh, the people who have literally fucking nothing are the ones that you should be afraid of. And Oh, by the way, we should be fear mongering about giving more money to the cops, which have already been deeply militarized beyond on any of our wildest imagination you know what i'm saying yeah 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 i watched olay on uh on the breakfast club this morning with oh, uh, eric bro. adams that's awesome everybody should watch that that's just, yeah dude fuck eric amazing. adams all my homies hate eric adams bro he i was getting triggered like so i don't good. know olay really in real life at all but she's come on yeah. the show a few times and i was like my, i'm like this guy was being fucking rude i was like bro who is gonna say something about this guy being rude as hell <laughs> yeah yeah She's confronting him. She's it's it's, it's, it's she's oh, in the yeah. room. She, with him. She, he had nothing really for her, bro. He's like looking off to be. I tweeted about it this morning. He like look. He's like looking for them to rescue him. It reminded me of when Connor's all wrapped up by Habib, and he's just looking at the ref like, "Are you gonna stop this?" It's like Eric Adams, like <laughs> yeah. a deer in the headlights every time Ole like fucking bats away and he kind of propaganda. I can't, I can't believe he's like a robot. It, uh, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like, like I, I guess you got to give him credit for that, I suppose. But um, I'd like to, I'd be curious to know how, like, how a that, lamb being walked to the slaughterhouse. <laughs> Imagine like Quentin yeah. Lucas just coming on the Vanguard or something. <laughs> Bro, you could never do that. that. One, that guy came into my bar one time, and he had like three security agents with him. So I don't think Quentin <laughs> likes uh, conflict. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly not. Some robot anyway, cop. Push, uh, did we want to? Did we want to get into the yeah. uh, first couple minutes of this? Hank, you said everything you want to to introduce the first, you know, four or five minutes. Oh sure, yeah. Um, so I I feel like there's probably more context I could give, but the if you want to just go ahead and play it, we could we could jump in. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that most people will kind of kind of get the point. It's mm. very well put together, very well narrated, and extremely well edited. Man, I was very impressed. I can tell you spent a lot of time getting this put together. So, you know, kudos to you on that. And as I said to everyone in our audience, make sure to check out the first part of this, which is out now. Second part drops in April, to my understanding. But I just put the link in the chat so you guys can bookmark that and watch the entirety of the documentary at your leisure after the show's over um, but yeah let's let's uh, take a look at this because there's some absolutely shocking details here and stuff oh. that even i wasn't aware of as someone who's been you know covering this talking about it for quite some years now very good let's do it Re- release the walmart meat oh sorry <laughs> On February 12th, 2020, a group of workers at the Young Turks came forward with a union. This Twitter page pops up out of nowhere, right? And it's TYT Union. They'd used card check, an election process in which 50%, I mean, if 50, let help, Bernie. If 50% of workers in a bargaining unit plus one sign a card saying they want to join a union, they will have a union. End of discussion. End of discussion. End of discussion. Fine. End of relationship. After nine days of silence, the company formally rejected voluntary recognition, saying they were prepared to voluntarily recognize the union, but only after a second election was conducted on terms more favorable to the company. While they wanted people to believe they were protecting the democratic will of the workers, it was in fact, as labor journalist Sarah Jones pointed out, classic union busting. Their statement was, put another way, total bullshit 
What followed was a period of union busting that seemed right out of the union busting playbook. Every single tactic was a tried and true technique for disrupting solidarity, save one, publicly smearing the workers' integrity, intelligence, and motivations by accusing them of being in a conspiracy with Cenk Uger's political opponent. I didn't misspeak. They accused their own workers of being part of a plot to disrupt Cenk Uger's political ambitions. What makes this unique is that most CEOs desperate to avoid a union are not talk show host politicians like Cenk Uger. So this tactic stands out and is the subject of this video. The other tactics, all documented in these four articles, none of which the company has refuted, might seem so familiar because as NLRB filings would later reveal, the Young Turks hired two anti-worker management side law and Can we pause it really quick? Since the home of progressives is I didn't know this until I watched the this when we were uh, planning on having you on, Hank. That's mm -hmm. fucking crazy. This is right here. This is damn incriminating for Jenk. I don't want to hear it from any simp. I don't want to call oh, the home of progressive news. No. And listen, we've been calling a spade a spade for a while, right? Because, uh, you know, the Vanguard will let y'all know when the, the goose is cooked, right? And their, their goose been cooked for a minute over here. Uh, but this is absolutely nuts that a company that claims to have progressive values, that claims to be like Bernie Sanders style Democrats or, you know, oh, because Jenks line is, you know, depending on what the topic du jour is, he's either never voting for the Democrats again, they're feckless, they're spineless, blah, blah, or what are you crazy? Do you think you're going to win with the Green Party? Have the Green Party? You know what I mean? So he oscillates between that. Uh, but what's clear is that, uh, as Gavin mentioned, it's all about the bottom line to this guy. And he reeks of it. He reeks of a guy that just wants to fucking make money. Um, and what's hilarious is that that's actually led to his own downfall. If you look at TYT, they're struggling. They're, uh, you know, they're not competing anywhere close to the level that they were. And they keep shooting themselves in the foot because potentially Anna can run off and get a job. At, I don't know, like the fucking Daily Wire, like Gavin was jesting about the other day, uh, if she wants to do the Dave Rubin pivot. Uh, but Jenk is pretty much. I mean, his his entire life is tied up in TYT. I don't see him jumping ship and doing another venture. And it's just going to be watching it go down the drain for, you know, the next decade till it gives up. Yeah, I think he wants to be kind of like a progressive Steve Bannon, a, a, a sort of kingmaker, you know, and there's there's sort of um, I mean, I, so as someone who's done like stand up and I do mostly solo pie, I want to get guests back on, you know, but as someone who's done a show. I feel like I'm a big narcissist ego maniac, even though I'm pretty sure I'm not. But like in order to do any kind of public show or whatever, you've got to have a little touch of that. And I think some people have a lot more than others, uh, including Jank, including Jimmy, you know, um, and, and that can actually be a, a, benef a benefit to a career. <laughs> like, I wish I had the kind of mental illness that made me wildly successful. <laughs> not the one that just makes me tired and upset all the time, you know. Uh, <laughs> so like. The but the 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 kind of hubris that goes into it, I think, also led him down a path of, um, you know, as much as I hate to admit it, he's a good talk show host. The guy built a big audience. I can't. So oh, I wouldn't. I'd, I'd yeah. sound like a tag off. I was like, oh, I don't think he's a good talk show host because I was a paying member for many years. I moved across. I sold a business and and gave up a that actually that business would have would, was amounted to be something pretty lucrative <laughs> later on. That's a that's an opportunity cost. Whatever. That's a side point. Um, I moved across the country. Uh, you know, I so I moved. I did a lot because of the guy's talk show host, but I don't think he's as good a business manager as he is a talk show. I think that hubris he's applied to his CEOing is what mm -hmm. I'm getting, like, kind of the point. Yeah, of getting at, I know what you're that. saying, and yeah, we definitely don't have to uh, be in denial about Jinx's talents as a broadcaster. I mean, he's incredibly, sure. incredibly charismatic. It is 100 why the Young Turks has been as successful as it has been over the years, and that was. I mean, kind of what was so exciting about TYT in the first place, at least when I discovered the channel, it was like, here's someone with the broadcasting talents of like a Keith Olbermann or something, but with genuine, quote unquote, progressive policies and politics. Um, right. And, you know, that's why this is all so important, because it's exposing the uh, you know hollowness of, of that whole pitch, right? That whole premise yeah. for the show. But yeah, let's watch just a few more well, minutes of this. Um, real fast, real you. fast. Yeah, that one on, let me just jump in. That one on the right there that says union avoidance, like if mm -hmm. a few frames more and I highlight the union avoidance and awareness stuff. Um, the one on the right is is, is uh, Mitchell Silberberg and Nup. They're a law firm that represents the AMPTP, by the way. Um, this is, I'm just giving, this is a detail that's revealed in the second project, but it's not like it's, this is public information. They're, um, 
as you guys remember, the IATSE actions and the SAG, the SAG strike, the writer strike um, was all against the AMPTP. And TOT uses the same law firm that uses that that represents the amptp maybe wow. they have multiple law firms they're big enough they probably do but yeah i think yeah. that's kind of kind of gross that's and crazy yeah and as we're about to find out potentially the craziest thing is that tyt members might have uh footed the bill for these well uh, <laughs> yeah the, the argument i'm making there is not that i know that they did it's just that they deserve to know if they did right absolutely just, yeah because I'm, I'm terrified of being sued <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I understand. Allegedly, <laughs> Jank, you petty bastard. I know you turned into the show when you hate watch. He <laughs> yeah, probably dude. wishes he could. Yeah, I mean, that would bring so much more attention to all of this. There's no way he would sue you. He doesn't want to be yeah. known as not only the union buster, but then the guy who tried to sue the whistleblower. Like, no, that, that's not going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> the only lawyer I can afford is Barbara Streisand. <laughs> Here. Because as NLRB filings would later reveal, the Young Turks hired two anti-worker management side law and consultancy firms. Since the home of progressives is largely member funded, it stands to reason that the audience deserves to know how much they spent on union busting, if any. How much member money did TYT send to these anti-worker law firms? Do they even have a right to know? Perhaps not. Shh. Best not, best not talk about it. 18 months later, Jenk Uger described his own union busting as merely a bumpy start. Our relationship got off to a bumpy start in the beginning. Bumpy start in the beginning. That was an Obama move right there. He almost succeeded in denying his workers, the very people on whose time, talent, and labor his career is built, their right to collectively organize. But after a tense few months, a second election was held, and bravo! A new union was born. After 18 months of negotiation, a contract was ratified. The union was official. Congratulations to my friends and comrades. Time for coffee cake. So pause it real quick here, right? Like, Hi. get ready. Right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the old studio. That's the current TV studio. That's me running... Um, there's Jimmy's show. If you guys that so I just wanted you to pause it there because that's like a that's the kind of era. That's the 2013, 2014, 2015 era. Right. Yeah, I have some nostalgia for watching TYT back in that time period. I want people yeah. to watch the documentary themselves so you get the clicks and all that stuff. So, like I said, oh. I put the link in the description. But let's segue into the next part of this because what the you know documentary is about to kind of segue into is talking about Jenks' congressional campaign and how yeah. he launched that and then basically used that to justify this weird conspiracy that the TYT union was actually like some political hit job or something. Uh, right. Do you want to just kind of right. talk a bit about that, how it all went down and what your guys's, you know, as organizers reaction was to this sure. bizarre excuse. Cause even I remember at the time reading reporting about this, I was like, wait, what he's blaming his campaign and saying that it's a conspiracy. This is beyond the pale. So let's, let's just talk a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah. That's the, that's kind of the reason. I mean, so I've been a political junkie guy watcher since my, my, I was a teenager, right. For like God, 30, like forever since the nineties. And I've never heard of a situation where a person running for Congress is also simultaneously busting a union and inc which includes a, a made up story that the union was a, originated as a ploy to intimidate as a, as a, as a, as a direct consequence of his decision to run. And I de definitely never expected to be the person right in the middle of that story. And it certainly wouldn't have predicted that that would, that person doing that would have been the progressive champion, Jank Uger. <laughs> so like, this whole thing is insane. It, it's just like really weird. And it just sort of struck me that this moment is just setting aside my own, in, my own like kind of bias. I'm way, obviously I'm way too deep and close to this whole thing to say I'm not by it, you know, but like trying to put that aside, it's a fascinating situation. It's so unique and weird to have a active politician doing active union busting. And it happens to be this massive hypocrite, Jen yeah. Uger, and just a completely pause, against the company. Just to pause you real quick. I mean, think about what a, actually a golden opportunity it could have been. He could have said, of course, let's have a union yeah. and and then said yeah. on the campaign trail. Yeah. See, look, I walk the walk. I talk the talk. I'm I'm a progressive and, and a business right. owner who's uh, actually respecting my workers ability to organize like that. That would have been great for his campaign, I think. 
Agreed. It would be the only bright spot of his of his 2019 2020 campaign right now. If you have further political ambitions, like this is something I was talking about in my shows, like just how completely stupid the decision to bust the union was for so yeah. many reasons, even coming from the foundation of someone who doesn't want a union. It's still like, don't you know that your market that you've been developing your audience yes. <laughs> should, would probably not receive this information positively while running for Congress on this platform that you look out for the little guy? And just like you said, like it, it would have been this, this, uh, the, this enormous upside, this one good bright spot of his entire thing. And he like, you're running for, you're going to run for president. I don't know if he knew he was going to run for president, but if you want to run for further office, having union buster on your record is a pretty <laughs> like major sale to, to right. put in the water. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. So there's even just for normie Democrats, even just for normie Democrats, I feel like a lot yeah. of them would get pissed off about that because a lot of the more old school Democrats in this country that might not right. even be like Bernie Sanders leftists, they still care about unions. There's a reason why every single Democratic candidate has all of their merch, T-shirts, all that stuff union made. It's a tradition because Democratic voters actually do care about that stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh, the only kind of uh, threat of uh optimism and hope for people on the left the left is so powerless in, in so many ways there's so many institutional barriers to getting any kind of power even if you can get somebody in they'll be like aoc and they'll probably start to kind of compromise their way out of it you know not that she's the only not you know not right you know, there's there's far also, worse people in congress than aoc like, for sure listening claire mccaskill guys had to get the union support in missouri you know what i mean right that's the line <laughs> for democrats claire yeah. mccaskill basically a republican but even yeah. she was like yep everything has to be by the book all the literature had to be printed by unions it's all a big deal so to think you're going to be the progressive guy with the union busting stain you if you're not donald trump you're not going to just get away with like the, you know treating your workers like shit for decades right 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 and then that's kind of why the i followed through with the movie um because there was so many times though, I just didn't want to, like, I got tired of this and didn't want to quit. And it was kind of like, fuck, I, I didn't, I didn't set out to make a big, long, like feature length thing. And actually I'm conceptualizing it now as a two part. There's a whole nother kind of topic that I want to make a second film about, even though I'm, I dread having to do that. Um, but so I started out just to sort of make a small version, just to describe the conspiracy stuff. Cause that's what really jumped out at me is like, this can't go undocumented. People need to know that this lie is out there. They never corrected the record on it. They still haven't corrected the record. I'm sure they must know about my what I'm up to nowadays. Now that I first put the first video out in uh, late February. Um, so it, as time goes on, it's just going to show further that they're trying to avoid this topic. I think they should address it. They should try to uh, retract. They should do a, an, an insincere apology. I don't think he's capable of a sincere one, but he should apologize anyway. Um, Anyway, so like the video got bigger and bigger as time got on because I realized like how um, much meat there was here. And plus the NLRB, in fact, I don't have the. Uh, yeah, if you guys recall in the video, um, the NLRB notice showed up, right? You guys remember this one, <laughs> this thing that showed up in the mail. This was never reported on. Like, isn't this a news story? It shouldn't. This was this was hung on the wall at TYT for 60 days. Um, sorry, the, it's, a, it's white balancing fuck, fucked up there. But um, that was required by law to be mailed to former employees as well as emailed and posted for 60 days. And there's a section in the video about that. I also clipped that one out on the channel. Nobody TOT covered that. And so as I was editing this, this thing and it was getting longer and I was having kind of personal issues and stuff and struggling with work and things. And so that, that slowed it down, but then this thing shows up and I'm like, well, this has to be in the video. And then that's what kind of drove me to like go rewind it back to the beginning of the campaign where we end up into the Bernie Sanders uh, endorsement and unendorsement and then the smearing that went on with the New York Times and, and, and such and such. And that's something that Zach or sorry, Gavin, I know you said you wanted to um, get into a little bit the political stuff. So it, the, the video sort of becomes a little bit like an unofficial document documentary about Jenks campaign as well. And I. You know, obviously, like the POV, this is the stuff that I'm, I'm enjoying talking about is sort of the filmmaking brain space, because just getting into the sort of umbrage brain space is kind of dragging it. Like, I feel very, it's very exhausting. I get excited to talk about like filming and when am I making the right narrative technique, the narrative decision, that sort of thing. Because um, I've been an inspiring filmmaker for a long time, too. So I couldn't like it was it just seemed like I was in the middle of this weird story. I had to tell it, you know, for lots of reasons. Um and I just, I just fucking forgot what I was going to say. So, <laughs> oh, it's all good, bro. There's another uh, really excellent clip from this that I wanted to quickly play that speaks exactly to what you were just talking about. So yeah. let's take a quick look here. 
quotes management's rule that concerns be brought directly to management rather than via Slack or emails that get sent to broad audiences. They were worried the truth would get out and use the leverage they have over workers to keep the audience in the dark. Secrecy favors the powerful. For 60 days, evidence that a prominent progressive CEO violated labor laws sat on the wall by the coffee machine and nary a peep from any of the journalists or hosts at TYT. Themselves literally on the other side of that wall telling a camera about employers who abuse workers and violate labor laws. You pause it. Ethics. Okay, every single video that's highlighted in that array there is within that 60-day period. It's hard to see the dates on there. I wasn't sure how to present that information. Um, but uh, every single date, if you look close enough, is uh, within that 60 days. So they were covering union stuff aggressively. Yeah. But they weren't covering their own boss's union stuff. And it seems to me that in a company that's grounded itself in, opt in like honesty and openness and, and transparency and all that stuff that the audience thinks they're paying for, that you should talk about what went on at your own company, especially with your own boss and be honest about it, you know? Uh, but I think the, partly the, the kind of thesis I'm, I'm heading towards with the, the overall project is that they don't want, they didn't want, they, 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 they use the conspiracy lie as a cover to prevent people from asking the very simple question, which is why did your workers start a union? So that's kind of the stuff that's going to get revealed in later uh, chunks of this is the, why we got started. That's the stuff Jenk doesn't want anybody to hear about. Right. And, you know, and I think some did, of those why didn't you immediately recognize it? You know what I mean? Well, yes. Yes. Yeah. That too. Yeah. Yeah. So like the two big kind of things are the why we started the union, which is the stuff Jenkins doesn't want anybody to know about. And then also the union busting itself, I think, are, are like yeah. the kind of major. major one one question I have for you um, mm -hmm. has to do with, I mean, we've talked a lot about Jenk Uger. Obviously, his narcissism is well dick documented, you know, his uh, hypocrisy well documented. Um, but as that screenshot revealed, you know, there was a lot of other TYT hosts that were essentially complicit in this in the sense that they kept their mouths shut about Jenks' own union busting practices while simultaneously, literally simultaneously, were going on air every day to excoriate other companies, media, corporations, et cetera, for doing the exact same thing. Um, so how, how did that make you guys feel? And what do you think it says about some of the other hosts on TYT? What do you think it says about their credibility uh, to have basically, you know, uh, kept quiet and continued to uh, try to uh, maintain this facade of progressivism while they knew damn well that their or uh, organization was not, in fact, living up to its values? See, that's where I get into the sort of um, power dynamics of this. Uh, I think it's it's fair to argue that it 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 it, it denigrates their credibility in that way. I I, I definitely think that's a, a reasonable argument to make. I would actually carve out Anna's role in terms of questioning credibility because she signal boosted. She was uh, placed into this kind of very difficult position um from his campaign as kind of the executive producer of tyt she took on even more responsibility if she was a member of the union maybe she could have got a pay bump for the for the responsibility creep you know but uh so she paid a pretty steep price emotionally like i know that it was really tough on her and genuinely like they were like one of the things that sucks about this whole thing is that jank and anna are uh, receive they, they and for years they've been the recipients of so much uh, ugly uh, gross shit on on online you know what i mean the kind of hate the stream of hate that flows at them and the, the scary stuff that that you get when you're in those kind of prominent positions and i don't like that this might contribute to that in any way that's sort of a, a something i don't like but she was was taking a lot of fire during that union uh during the campaign but because she didn't check the story uh, as far as well, how the union originated, she signal boosted and, and uh, there's actually a, 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 a bit in the very beginning where she's air quoting the phrase union busting. That's from a, a, an interview on the No Mickey Cons show that's going to be featured in an upcoming chunk. Um, so she sort of gave that like really important, like epoxy takes two, two, two parts, if you guys know how, how epoxy works, if you've ever done a good repair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm actually pretty ignorant <laughs> about epoxy. I've seen some videos where people make the tables out of it and stuff. Those are cool. It's 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 glue. It's just it's just fancy glue. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so like I, I'm just dis dif differentiating between the overall the hosts that you asked about and Anna's credibility because I think Anna rightfully 
failed big time in this story. She did not, what as far as I know, know, and according to me, as far because I was a direct source on this whole thing, as well as other people I spoke to, also direct sources on it. She never checked the story. So if she did actually check the story, and then still, so like both both possibilities are horrible. Is one is she didn't check the story, and then she signal boosted the lie. The other is that she did check the story, and she signal boosted the lie. Both of those are terrible. Both of those need to be answered for. And I think like kind kind of the the where I'm going with the sort of power dynamics of this thing is that that's the part. Like I think there's a, there's a line where I say like sacrificing your or uh, compromising your own uh, credibility to. to to protect the boss's feelings is a perfect example. Like I say something like along those lines is that I'm sort of, it's not every, everything sources back to the person who's in charge and the, tr like, so for the hosts, yeah, I think it's fair to call them out for not covering it and all that stuff, but that's because that they would have faced negative consequences if they had told the truth about, or, or even covered it right or clearly, or, or, or maybe they can come out and say, Hank's full of shit. This wasn't newsworthy. We made an editorial decision not to cover a uh, prominent progressive CEOs union busting. Maybe that's the case they, they could try to make. But I th in Anna's case, though, she's a journalism professor, I think still. I don't know if she still does it or not, but she didn't check the story like there, like and it was the most confirmable story in journalism history. Like the sources for the story were 10 feet away and were people that she knew for years or just me. She, you know, I, I knew, you know, known Anna over the years. We, we, were, we weren't close, but we had, you know, plenty of like you know honest straightforward conversations i always felt like you know like we if she had reached out we would have had a respectful discussion and you know what i mean it would have been totally fine for her to get in touch with me and say what's going on here when did the union start because the union started like months before actually a over a year before as i get into some of the detail later on in the video a lot of people uh, in the like, chat are wondering also uh what was jimmy's response to the union was he at tuit at the time I um I don't know how much Jim, I think well, Jimmy calls Jenk out for union busting quite a bit. It's 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 one of the arrows in his but quiver. But that's a that's a later development. That yeah. wasn't until yeah. more recently, I would say post 2020 because at one point there's Jimmy's on record as defending Jenk for the Katzenberg money. It was before he right. decided that you know he was going to use it as a cudgel, which is funny because now Jimmy also does his own paid ad reads because he has no soul or moral convictions. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But it is really good silver. Let's be honest. That's that's high grade stuff. That's it's, it's, it's pure silver. Um, I, I, I no, I, there wasn't any like direct support in a way, and uh, he probably should have. I mean, he might have been vocal. I, I'm just I don't want to speak as if I thoroughly researched that, and, and, I, and I can say confidently that he never spoke up in in support of it. I so like with Jimmy to kind of go back to a thing we were a thread we left earlier. I was uh, not on great terms with Jimmy since it ended in 2016, like late 2016, right before the Placone, the long may he reign, the, 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 the great, <laughs> the, right before that started, the second camera. So I wasn't like in, in a good state with Jimmy, but we weren't like beefing or anything like that. It just was like, all right, well, fuck you. I'll go my way. You go yours. Fine, whatever. And then when I went back to TYT to be a video editor in 2018, I was a... Uh, 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 the aggressive progressive video editor so i did a lot of editing i edited his show so he'd come in and i was like oh shit now i gotta deal with and we 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 chatted we we we, we kind of buried the hat you know it wasn't like a bad thing I, but as like stand-ups there's always sort of that kind of like stand-up guy like okay you're i don't know we sort of just fell back into that role of being like a guy you know who's uh that sort of thing so to answer your question long-winded that there wasn't really much there uh, as far as i could tell but I'm not too, I'm not, I, there is going to be more Jimmy in the video, but I'm not really focusing on that point of whether he's fair enough. About it. But it's a fair question. I think it's reasonable. Yeah. You know, and unionize Jimmy Dore's staff too. We should unionize Jimmy Dore's staff. Yeah. So. Fat chance he supports that, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Well, anyway, like I said, everyone, make sure to check out the documentary. Is there any other aspect of the story that you wanted to share on today's show or, you know, talk about um, further? Yeah. We definitely want to have you back when you're next up. Yeah, man, I'm, drops if, I'm if down, down to come back anytime. Uh, there's so th I think, Gavin, you mentioned the ethics stuff or was it, or did we already kind of cover that? Because like that's where the sort of uh, meat of the like the journalistic ethics, like what is the journalist's responsibility to their audience? And and, and they pretended that they were fulfilling their their responsibility um, right. like that. The interview with Matt Taibbi and Katie Halper is I, so instructive of like where Matt TB have asked him if like, even if someone kicks you in the balls and Jake is like, yeah, my independent, my, my source, my, my investigators are so strong. I, I, I'm a little worried that they'll come at me. And then you did a thing that should have been investigated and then nobody spoke up about it. 
So it was insulting. It was fucking insulting to work for a place where you give a shit about the audience and you have a passionate feeling about the progressive. Like, because one thing TYT benefits from is the feeling that you're sort of there for the activism. So you're, you know, it's like less pay than if you work in the industry, like up in the, you know, commercials or TV or, or movies or something like that. So you, it, automatically on the website, you know that your pay is going to be low. But then there's that like little, extra low pay because it's activism you kind of get this feeling that and that's not necessarily like, i've had multiple conversations with people at toit over the years about that exact thing so um it's not even that i'm not even saying that as a judgment just that you're already on the low end of that whole deal right because i care i actually really believe in this shit and, and believe in, in honesty and all that stuff and then walking out the door they ask you to sign an nda you know which i found outrageous that, that like, i had a severance tied to an nda um which and, is bullshit uh, by the way we call that extortion of poor people uh every fucking horseshit organization i yeah. like uh there's a there was a shady ish like just a poorly run publication in kansas city i won't say more about it but i had a homie that worked there and mm -hmm. uh they got fired under like really like just kind of shady circumstances like oh, okay i had beef with the editor and now i'm getting let go because they didn't like my fucking angle or whatever it is you know petty bullshit uh and then they were like oh yeah don't go public with this so you got to sign an nda otherwise you don't get to eat or pay your rent and your entire financial situation is ruined and you're like oh well right. that's a equal power dynamic that's great for workers in this country yeah yeah there was no no way in hell i was going to sign that nda it even has a provision saying you're not allowed to acknowledge the existence of the nda other than to a lawyer an accountant or a spouse you know so like uh, yeah. that, literally asking you to, to lie that's a that's saying that you are committing to lie on our behalf if someone asks you if there's an nda and you say yes you would be in violation of the nda that's that's like what the fuck is this shit? you know so among those that's various where jimmy things must have got the idea from <laughs> could be <laughs> yeah, jimmy and jank bump into each other at the nda store have yeah. an awkward, awkward conversation <laughs> so yeah anyway i don't know I, 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 I could definitely keep going but like um yeah, it just was one of those things that I just couldn't let go. And I was just like, this this story needs to be told. 